Um, so yes, I'll talk about relevant search in PubMed. Uh, this has been my main project uh, at the NIH, especially at the NCBI. Um, so first I'd like to introduce a little bit uh, more uh, what it said a lot already. Uh, so I got my PhD in 2015, then I joined the NIH in 2016, and I've been working on relevant search mostly, but also on PubMed Labs, which is another uh, platform for um, experimenting new research-based uh, algorithms. I've been doing a lot of log analysis as well and some neural networks uh, for uh, various tasks such as autocompletion. Uh, please ask your questions as the talk uh, goes. Uh, I'm happy to take them within uh, the talk rather than having all of them at the end. So uh, now an introduction to PubMed. So I don't know if you're aware of PubMed, um, but this is a, a search engine uh, for the biomedical literature search. Um, it has more than 28 million articles. Um, we have daily 2.5 million users, 3 million searches, and m more than 9 million abstract views, meaning uh, each article is one abstract view. Um, we have to be up 99.99% .99 of the time, so that's quite a, a high con a constraint. And so we need to have scalable and fast approaches. Um, this is important because we will always need to, to be product oriented rather than doing theoretical formal research uh, for the sake of it. These are monthly or daily? daily. All of these statistics are daily, yeah. So when I joined, I focused on user satisfaction and I wanted to make sure that, uh, or I wanted to think about how we could improve user satisfaction per med. And uh, the idea I had was to provide more relevant, result, more relevant results, especially because of the previous system was not that up to date uh, compared to the literature. Uh, so to do that, we needed to, do, to have a better understanding of user needs so that we could reduce their browsing time but also engage them more in using the system. And one way to improve the relevance, thanks to Google, is to rely on newer approaches using machine learning and uh, they, there have been uh, evidences that Google changed the way that uh, we search. Especially um, this study here is about how people remember about keywords they use to perform a search to access certain information rather than remembering the actual information. Uh, so this is known as cognition of loading. And the proof of this is that in order to find this paper, I had no idea about the title author's year it was published. I just knew the keywords uh, to find it. So we want to do something like this also. And uh, so the previous system we had was a TF-IDF based system. And we wanted to use machine learning to optimize, especially the first page, to provide our users with an experience that is similar to Google. Because we realized that uh, many users, some advanced users, long time users of PubMed didn't have this expectation. But many new users expected a system that would behave like Google, meaning uh, free text queries and a smart system that could um, easily identify relevance. And so the idea is uh, to follow this comic that I really like is to provide a system that would optimize the first result so much that if you have to reach another page, then it means that you will probably find nothing interesting. So at the time, uh, there wasn't really a lot of work. We, we started working on this in 2016 and uh, the literature from 2014 and 15 didn't have a lot of clues only a few papers. Uh, but at the time, so there was a TF-IDF or BM25 model that was already in place. And these models are good for uh, quickly scoring documents thanks to the reverse index and the stored statistics like the inverse document frequency. Um, so although these documents, this scoring system is usually good, it's not sufficient to provide a very optimized first page of results. So it is a good first layer to process documents and find potentially relevant documents. And the key idea that we had was to um, using learning to rank in order to uh, re-rank these results into a, a more optimized way. So the first layer that we have in our architecture is the following. It's a traditional search engine where a user types a query. The search engine finds uh, the, the, re the potential, the matching documents in the index scores them using BM25 or standard uh, um, scoring systems, and then returns them to the user. So instead of returning them to the user, we use a second layer, which uh, relies on machine learning. So we have, um, let's assume for now that we have documents, queries, and training labels. So for each query, we have a set of documents, 
And we have also, for each document, a training uh, relevant uh, score for this document, for this specific query. Now we could derive features from the document, the query, and from both of them, like matching between the document and the query. And if we fit them into a learning to rank algorithm, along with the training label, we would uh, train a model that is able to learn the best uh, ranking ordering for, uh, for these uh, triplets or these documents for this query. And so this is what we did. Um, we used Lambda Mart as, a, as the learning to rank algorithm. And so when we have a new query uh, in PubMed, it goes through uh, the search engine as uh, traditionally. We retrieve documents, we score them using BM25 in, in this case, and then we obtain the full list of results that we split here, and we take the top 500 documents and we fit them into the model that we have learned offline, assuming again that we have all these things. We re-rank them and then we put them back in, at the top of the list. And this normally should provide a more optimized uh, uh, beginning uh, top of the list. Now, the problem is that uh, we need a training table and that's known to be uh, a quite a big problem right now um, because in the biomedical data set, in the biomedical literature, there, uh, there isn't any uh, gold standard for this. We also need to define which features we will be using for training the learning to rank algorithm uh, from the document queries and both. We need to find an algorithm, so we used Lambda Mart, and I'll talk briefly about this uh, right after this. We need to make sure that the scalability of the search engine is fine. And again, this is again for uh, the, the PubMed is considered an authority in the domain, so we, we do have to make sure that this is scalable enough. And finally, we will need to test the model and find a way to evaluate it, as well as evaluate the quality of the ranking after all of these steps to make sure that this is actually consistent with what the users expect. So there are many uh, algorithms that we can use for learning to rank. Uh, we decided to use Lambda Mart um, because at the time, and I think even now it is the state of the art algorithm doing this, the main reason being that it uses uh, a ranking metric uh, within its definition. So what we want to do is to um, provide a score to each document for a given query that if you order the documents according to this score, you would reach an ordering that is similar to the gold standard order. Again, let's assume that we have one right now, and I'll describe later how, how, we, how we actually had this uh, gold standard. It's a pairwise ranking algorithm, so it evaluates pairs of documents and whether or not they should be uh, i, j, or j, and then i. But it also integrates an overall ranking metric, and for instance, it can integrate NDCG, which is good because the limitation of uh, pairwise algorithms are usually that they don't have a consideration for the entire list of results. By integrating NDCG in the objective function of Lambda Mart, you can make sure that although you compare pairs of documents, you still have a sense of how good the list, the ranking of the list is. And so it's a gradient boosted uh, tree algorithm. So at each iteration, it calculates the gradient for each document, which is the sum of all the weights for each pair of documents. And so it, it calculates the direction which the document should move to according to other pairs and the global NDCG uh, metric. Then it it's builds a forest of trees uh, based on the gradient boosted trees that are learned iteratively. So the requirements of such an approach is that first we need to have a gold standard. And so far I said, let's assume that we have one, but uh, the main limitation was that we didn't have one at the time. Um, we also need to find out which features might convey that the document is good and relevant for a given query. We need to find a way to evaluate it. And we need to make sure that, again, it's scalable enough. And um, the first question I wondered is, is, is it reasonable at all to rely on machine learning for this? And well, it was looking good because, first of all, it's a tree ensemble model. Uh, Lambda Mart is a tree ensemble model, meaning that it's long to train because you need to iteratively train uh, trees. But at prediction time, it can be multi-threaded. So it looked like it was something that could work in production. So now I'll talk about um, the gold standard creation, uh, which was actually a lot of work, more than the pipeline implementation, because uh, we are using algorithms that already exist. So you can always try to optimize them or optimize the features. But actually, this is the most critical part. The good thing of PubMed is that we have anonymous data 
on the query logs, so queries that users uh, typed, and also their, their next actions after they typed the query and searched. So we collected 20 months worth of uh, searches that used relevance, and at the time that wasn't much uh, because not many people were aware of the relevance mode in PubMed. And then for each query that was run, we stored the first 20 documents that, was re that were returned by the system at the time, which was again a TF-IDF uh, system. And we also uh, store any further document that was clicked, meaning that the first 20 documents are the documents of the first page of PubMed. PubMed has 20 documents uh, on the first page. And we also store all documents that were clicked beyond the first page. And for each document that were clicked, and that was clicked, we store the number of abstract clicks and the number of full text clicks. So abstract clicks is the number of clicks on a document after a search, so in the search results. And the full text click is the full text request from a user. So sometimes once they reach an, they reach an article, they can download the, the, the PDF or go to the editor or the publisher. All of these interactions requesting the full text are also stored. So we don't know about this, but it, it is definitely a signal of this paper is relevant. We don't know if it means it's more relevant than simply clicking the abstract. We might assume so, but we cannot show it. Uh, but, it's, but these two things are definitely signals that users uh, had an interest into this specific article. So um, we have some queries that appear multiple times in 20 months, and I'll talk more about this, by the way, uh, because I have to say we have some queries appearing more than one time in 20 months. That's definitely not a majority of the query that occur more than uh, one time. So what we did is for each of those queries occurring multiple times, we added the number of clicks on each article. And uh, I talk about the abstract click and full text click here. And then we removed outliers uh, because some queries appeared less than three times. And the idea of this is that if a query appears less than three times, it means that only one user maybe searched for this query and had interactions with documents. And we don't think that this is um, reliable enough for us to, to use this as a relevance signal. And the, the main idea is that one single user shouldn't be driving the entire learning um, um, for the learning trank. What percentage of uh, queries appeared less than three times? Sorry? How much of your data are you throwing away by doing that? Yeah, I'll talk about this later on. Yeah, uh, I don't want to answer this right now, but I will. Um, so, so if the data is limited, um, which was our case at the time, we can always think of more uh, of smarter approaches for instance, by considering n-grams instead of the entire query, using synonyms in the query, uh, and, and create artificial queries uh, with data augmentation, topic modeling, clustering. We can use all of this, and we did, uh, but I won't be reporting on this today. Um, because, well, first of all, it's, it's not published. Uh, and second of all, because I think we'll, you all see what I mean by using n-grams and clustering queries to, to get more sense of, uh, Let's say that you have a lot of unique queries, you aggregate them, and then you aggregate the relevant signals uh, for, for each cluster of queries. But, uh, without going into the details, does it seem to work? It works, it works for data augmentation, yes. It creates bigger data sets. Now, it doesn't mean that it, it's more relevant, uh, but in general, bigger data means that you have more chances to learn something useful. Uh, That's, you, you were able to get more data. I, I think the question was whether uh, you got better no, in this case, that's only for getting more data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So now we have query, documents, uh, query document pairs. And for each of these pairs, we have a number of abstract click and a number of full text clicks. And so the question is, for this specific query, how should we order the document to create the gold standard order? So we created a, an indicative function that, is, uh, that takes one if a full text is available for an article and zero if the full text is not available. And we define the relevance level, which is a score associated to each document that is using the number of abstract clicks for this specific document for this specific query, the number of full text clicks uh, for this specific document for this specific query, 
we have a parameter here that controls the weight of abstract click and full text click, and this refers directly to what you said about the importance of full text compared to abstract. This can be controlled over uh, this parameter. And this part of the equation is actually a boost because we notice that some articles are clicked the same number of times. Uh, their abstract is clicked the same number of times, but some articles didn't have the full text available, so they had no click on the full text. And some other articles did have the full text available, but were never clicked. So this part is, also, is only to control how much weight do you want to give to articles that were clicked the same number of times on abstract, but did or did not have the, the full text. So here, by using this equation for um, evaluating the relevance of documents for a given query, uh, the clicks represent a proxy for relevance. And this formula is inspired from PageRank. Um, in essence, what it means is that we're trying to say that relevance is approximated by the popularity of documents for a given query. Now, the question I had was, isn't it too simple of a representation for relevance? And uh, I think it is. I still think it is. Uh, and at the time, actually, this simple equation was supposed to be a baseline for a system to train on and see whether, whether or not it would work. But it happened to be a more robust relevance definition that more, elaborated, uh, more elaborate formula. And I think there are two reasons for this. One of them is that our users actually go pretty deep in the list. Uh, because before it was a TF-IDF uh, metric, users tended to go to up to the fifth page, so hundreds of results. That's great because it gives us a lot of information about the deeper relevant documents and how to rank them at the very top. But also, um, I think that this relevance function is also good because um, if we add more signals, we have to add more parameters, we have to um, make it more complicated, it's actually very difficult to make it sane while integrating more and more parameters. And it becomes the, the relevance function right here becomes almost a learning problem where you have to find the, the optimal relevance function. It becomes so complicated that actually a simple relevance function like this seems to work well. And finally, the algorithm, like I will show you, uh, given the features, doesn't have a direct way or straightforward way to come up with this function. It doesn't have all the elements to calculate exactly this function and so come up with the optimal solution representing this. It will have elements that, if it combines, might be approximating this relevance function, but it cannot really um, find it. So let's say that... Um, we have this, and what we need now is we have, a, so we have an ordered list of documents and we need to have labels associated with each document. So in the end, we had uh, 36,000 queries, and for each of those queries, we had documents retrieved by, let's say, BM25, and we had the gold standard results. What we did is scoring the gold standard, uh, is scoring the 500 results according to their position in the gold standard meaning that we won't be trying to model the relevance of documents. Learning to rank is not supposed to learn the relevance score of each document, but rather the ordering. So what we did is come up with an ordering. The first 10 documents that appear in the gold standard retrieved by BM25 get a score of 12 to 3. The next 10 documents get a score of 2. The remaining documents get a score of 1. So these are the remaining uh, relevant documents. And the irrelevant documents get a score of 0. And note the emphasis that is put on the top 10 documents here. Um, this is only to, to make sure that the top of the list is also more optimized than uh, the other relevant documents. So now we need to find out features. And the question we ask is what may convey that a document is good for a given query? We came up with uh, query-based features, document-based features, and query document-based features. Here's the entire list, and I realize this might be small, uh, but the slides will be available. So um, on the document features, we have, for instance, the publication year, the clink information, and I'll touch base on this briefly, the publication type, document length, language, all of these things are, are quite traditional. Um, we also have query features, which try to uh, categorize queries. And finally, the most important features are uh, the query document features, which essentially capture how much the documents match the query. 
Um, the most important features in this case were the proximity features developed in 2010. Uh, they capture how close the terms are within the document. Um, and the closer the terms are in the document, the better normally. So if you look for, for instance, breast cancer treatment, it's better to find in the text breast cancer treatment as a phrase rather than breast and cancer and treatment in three different places. And so an important point is on click information. So we do use as a feature the popularity of documents, but this is irrespective of the query, meaning that um, if a single article is clicked for many queries, it will have a high, sorry about that, it will have high uh, clicking features but this does not really correlate necessarily with the relevance function. So it has part of the elements, and I think that the reason why this algorithm will be working very well it is because it has no direct way to actually model the relevance function. It has this element, which is the popularity of features of documents irrespective of the queries, but then it needs to fill the gap and take this extra step to find out what else means that the document is relevant for a query. We do because we have the past. We have the past um, click information for a document for the last year, for instance. Uh, but right. it's irrespective of the query. Let's say that a document is just on mm -hmm. um, Yes, fortunately, that's not the only signal. Um, um, I'm not sure about the order of. Uh, how of importance of each signal. I remember that proximity is, is one big one. Publication year is also extremely important and actually publication year is antagonist to the click information usually uh, because publication year will try to promote more recent documents and we know that in, in PubMed people, although they use the relevance, they want more recent documents. So these two features will be comp competing with each other to find a good balance. Go back to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what do you mean by proximity? Okay. So let's assume that you have a system that returns n results, out of which you take 500 being the top ones uh, scored by BM25. Yeah. Okay. Now you also have another set, which is the gold standard, where you have your all your um, documents with clicks and abstract clicks ranked according to the relevance function I described earlier. That one. Number of abstract clicks on this document oh, and number of full text clicks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's that's fine. Okay. So what you said is the relevance function biased by the fact that yeah. you collected the logs from a previous search. Engine. Yeah, it's uh, it's a limitation, yeah. definitely. And um, is there a way? Do you have any way to measure how that bias reduces as you implement it in your system? Yes. Um, Yes, we have ways and actually as we compute this model on the previous system, we can iteratively improve the, the, the model by recalculating on newer logs and so on and so forth up to some optimal at some point. Um, there is a way to see it and actually I think the, the, well, it's not, we cannot really evaluate the bias, but we can evaluate how users react to the newer, uh, newer models. So my expectations when we were doing this were that um, users would be missing some information and there isn't really a way to quantify this, uh, to quantify how much information they're missing because some documents are, are too deep in the list. But as, as uh, we promote them more and more, as we iterate over better and better models, people tend to click more at the top. So it seems to show that people miss less things. So all of this was offline, right? So all the log analysis, collection of data, creation of gold center, that was offline. And we had to evaluate this system also offline before we could do anything uh, live. So there are multiple ways to evaluate this sort of system. Uh, of course, we could use precision and recall, but again, here we're trying to optimize the ranking. So precision and recall don't really matter. They would remain unchanged for the top 500 documents anyway. So this is a different task actually, which is the retrieval 
And we should optimize the top 500 documents that are retrieved, but that's not in the scope uh, of this uh, presentation. So what we cared about is how, once we have these 500 documents, how we should rank them. And in order to evaluate ranking, there are multiple measures. Uh, I just listed two of them. NDCG is the most popular one. And it evaluates uh, ranking with different uh, relevance uh, labels up to a certain uh, threshold. And MRR is the same, but actually it focuses on the first relevant document. So um, it, doesn't really good, it doesn't really give a good um, estimation of the overall relevance. And so we decided to go with NDCG to evaluate. And the main reason is that, for instance, for a query like breast cancer treatment, what is the relevant document? There wouldn't be one. There would be many of them. So we need to actually take account of the various grades of documents. So that's why we decided to use NDCG. So that's the offline evaluation. We evaluated NDCG at different thresholds. Uh, the first one is the um, uh, number of results in the first page of, of PubMed. And then we uh, tested different granularities up to the first document. So the results were really good. Um, and it only means that the model was able to fit the gold standard, which is not, which is not easy. Uh, because even though the function is easy to understand for us, the lambda mark didn't have any clue really to, to get what the relevance was, meaning how to predict the number of abstract click and full text clicks of a paper is not straightforward given the features that we provided to it. No, it's not one of the features, but it is integrated within the lambda mart algorithm. Meaning that if, if a document is very deep, it will, and it should be higher, it will get a sum of the weights, of the pairwise weights, pairwise errors, a lot greater. So it will get to the top positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's possible to create bias. And, uh, and a lot of the work is actually now that we've released all of this and published, it's almost published, but now that we, we are actually uh, transparent about this, now we're thinking about how we can make sure that people are not using this uh, to, to uh, have biased relevance representations to promote their own papers and so on and so forth. But this is not really about the learning, this is more about the data collection. So it's back to the problem of how do you create a gold standard now that there is this potential, um, yeah. So, um, so yes, this, these scores only show that the model was able to fit the relevance function that we created. That's good. Um, and it fits quite well, up to 50% almost uh, of NDCG. The other thing I would like to mention is that actually even the NDCG at one is really good compared to the, to the baseline. And I think this is mostly due to the fact that we had different relevance labels associated to the very top of the list. Because normally when you optimize lambda mart towards NDCG at 20, for instance, you would get a very good NDCG at 20, but then a very high drop in quality for the top documents. And we didn't observe that, I think, because the top documents in the gold standard were ranking 12 to three, and then two, and then one. So although we're optimizing the NDCG at 20, Lambda Mart still has to make sure that the NDCG at one is good. So this is, again, some more uh, offline evaluation. This is the, uh, the proportion of queries that had NDCG at zero to one. And before re-ranking, so using BM25, we noticed that actually a lot of um, queries got a score of zero or close to zero using BM25. Now, after we added the learning to rank, we observed very good results. And although we have a satisfying peak at one, uh, it's definitely not the most represented score. And actually what we observe is that we have overall improved the quality for all, all queries, but not by much. Uh, so it's, it's not like a few queries are optimized a lot. It's rather that um, all queries get some improvement out of the learning to rank. Another way to visualize this is uh, how queries improved or deteriorated uh, after learning to rank. So all of this 
part means that the query got improved. This part left to zero means that the queries got deteriorated. So again, we show that um, a lot of the queries got improved somehow. Uh, some of them got improved a lot, and, but most of them were improved uh, just slightly. And regarding the queries that were deteriorated using learning to rank, actually we noticed that their BM25 scores or the ranking given by BM25 was not that good anyway. And so it got deteriorated, but not by, um, because it, it was actually very difficult to improve. So it's, I think, just a side effect of trying to learn a model on all of these queries. And I'll touch base again on the um, no free lunch theorem, uh, on, by the way. Not that we could find, no. Uh, well, nothing obvious, let's say. I, I did some uh, sampling, eyeballing, clustering. I didn't see anything obvious um, for this. So now we have to make sure it's scalable and evaluated on nine. <clears throat> so at the time, the, oh, sorry. Yes, and uh, I wanted to add a slide on this before I arrived, but I didn't have time. Um, yes, we did a, a feature ablation study where we saw the... So one thing uh, is that you're creating your branches by using scripts, right? mm -hmm. and then you use that again as a feature for your API. But it's a different source of clicks. There, and that's my point, and I think the reason why it works is that they're not correlated. So, it, so the, the clicks that we use as a feature is the broad popularity of a paper within a year, no matter what the queries are to reach that paper. And it could be even from Google, not, with, not after a query. It could be any access to this paper. So it really gives a sense of how good the paper is in general, whereas the score that we give to the gold standard is how good this document is for this specific query because people clicked on this after this query. So that's, and I think this is why it can learn. Uh, and this discrepancy between the two signals makes the learning to rank algorithm makes, make this extra step to model relevance really and not just um, a flavor of click information that it already has. You mentioned that features are not uh, continuing, uh, you include any um, code that's coming even from Google search. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, full text, only for full text, yeah. Abstract is, is, has to be from a search results page. So um, in 2016, there was a learning to rank plugin in Solar, which is the, the platform that we decided to use. It was created by Bloomberg. It was not really official at the time, and we decided to use it and tweak it and make sure that it would work. Uh, but since then, actually, while we were developing our own branch of it. It was released par as part of the official uh, Solar release. So um, now we're trying to go back to this official one. But still, we did have to do some custom tweaks in order to make sure that it was uh, scalable enough. Like I said, since it's a uh, tree ensemble model, it's actually good for predicting in real time. Uh, but the problem is the feature calculation, because some of the features can take a lot of time, especially when you're trying to see um, whether w the positions of matches, for instance. Um, things like this can be optimized through the index, for instance. So we did some of that. We also use better data structures and parallel computation. Uh, but in the end, we managed to reach the threshold that uh, permit requires for a live production setting, which is 1,000 requests per second. And so the online evaluation that we took is using the click-through rate. Um, this is the number of queries with at least one click on an article ranked K or lower. So for instance, the number of clicks, the number of queries where there was a click on the first page of results, at least one, divided by the no total number of eligible queries. And eligible only means that there were more than one result for this query, meaning that where rank was, ranking ordering was um, useful at all. So this is the online evaluation. Don't uh, pay attention to the uh, banner right now. So there are three systems, um, but they couldn't be represented in one graph. So, so I present here the system sorted by date. So this is the click-through rate for date-sorted results. This is the click-through rate for um, 
relevant sorted results after learning to rank. And this guide here is the previous system where it stood uh, before we switched. So 35% click-through rate got increased to almost 40% recently. Um, I think right now it's about 39%. And you can notice actually that before at this time, the click-through rate was actually increasing a lot. And I think this is because people realized that um, the new relevant system was doing better and better. So it sort of engaged them in using it, uh, using it more because it came from the 35% and increased. So it really looked like uh, users liked this system more and started using it uh, more, at least clicking on the first page more. Uh, so this is uh, a user searches something and then chooses to either sort by relevance or by date? No, uh, this is, they have decided whether or not they will sort by date or relevance. Before they search? Yes. And, and this is after a search whether or not they clicked on the first page. Really? There. Um, at the time, it was only 7%, and now it has increased to almost 14% of users, of queries are sorted by uh, relevance now. So, um, at the time, not much. And, uh, and that's why we evaluate it in two ways, one being the click-through rate, but also the other one being usage, how people use it um, over time. Mm -hmm. That was before you released Banner, and I'm not sure what Banner is. But yeah, I'll talk about this. So the Banner was a way to promote uh, the, the best match. Um, but I'll, I'll touch base on this. I see. So the model was integrated even before July? Yes. So before July there, we did, uh, so from January to June, we did A-B testing. Um, but it's difficult to represent all of this because um, there were essentially three systems uh, at the time, and I don't have statistics on the entire period from January to, to June. So you're saying the more reliable part is after July? When we actually switched. Because, because now 100% uh, of users are actually using the best match, the new learning trank algorithm. Whereas before it was a mix of different systems, and uh, we also know that some users did get the learning trank Sometimes and sometimes they got the TFIDF didn't really understand. So why is uh, TFIDF fixed? No, it's not fixed. It's just to show where it used to be. Okay. But it, it used to vary like this as well. Uh, but it was always around the 35% mark. So um, back to the uh, to the proportion of unique queries that you asked earlier. Um, Permanent is on a specific domain. And this means that actually a lot of the queries are unique in PubMed. This graph shows that uh, it shows the number of occurrences of queries and the number of them. So for instance, this means that a lot of queries occur only one time within a year. And it has a very long tail, but we just noticed that very few queries occur many, time, many times over a year. And this is just to zoom in. Uh, so it shows that 80% of queries occur only once in a year. And um, I think it, if you sum this up, it's something like 98% of queries appear less than 10 times in a year. Yes, it's, uh, I have this, not at hand, but yes, it's usually uh, three to four words. The, the, uh, the median, I think, is three words. Not only, so yeah, so just so you know, there you go. So on query unicity, there are almost 1,200 unique queries every day that start with breast cancer, 1,200. And this is just an example of these. Just to give you a sense of how various the queries can be, I don't know if you have this about the same in Semantic Scholar, uh, but in PubMed, this is what we observe, and, and we think this is only due to the vocabulary that is very specific. Um, and this unicity is very hard to, hard to deal with because it's hard to, to evaluate relevance 
for each of these different queries. So the question we had at the time was also how relevant is our system, meaning that if we have a lot of unique queries, most of which we filter out for training, we rely only on, of, on those, the minor ones that occur more than three times within a year, how are we making sure that we're not overfitting just the popular queries at the cost of unique queries? And so we did a click-through analysis on the, on the query distribution. And what we noticed is actually that the unique queries here are the ones that are getting the overall click-through rate that we get. And that's a zoom. So unique queries, which represents, again, almost 90% of queries in PubMed get a, an, an average click-through rate of almost 41%. So this is really the volume of queries that are guiding the overall click-through rate that we observe at, at the website scale. And then for all queries up to, uh, occurring up to 10 times, we observe similar uh, click-through rates. So what this means is that although we trained on queries that had more, that occurred more than three times, we discarded all unique queries. We didn't take into account their relevant signals. We focused only on more popular queries. The system was able to generalize well to unique queries as well. So now on usage, like I mentioned, uh, it was used to use used uh, about 7% of uh, permit queries and now it's reaching 14%, so it has almost doubled. Um, and you see that the increase started after we released the new algorithm. Now, um, is it the next one? Yes. Now, I have to admit that this increase is also due to the best match banner that I mentioned earlier. And so the best match banner is this widget. So if someone is looking for, is, is searching a query using date sort, this sort of ad would pop up if it identifies that this is an informational query. So we have two types of queries on PubMed, both equally represented informational queries, which are more topical, like this one, or we also have known item queries, like a title, for instance. Um, um, Lana from our team has developed the field sensor, which can, yes? So when you were saying that most of, when you were giving the statistics on how uh -huh. often the queries are repeated, is that just on the informational queries? Both. Yeah, it's uh, even even informational queries and topical queries. We don't really have something that is so popular that everybody looks for it. Like deep learning in a broader system would be a typical one. In surgery, cancer-related queries, it's it's so various that we observe the same uh, unicity. And you have We apply the same one, and that's part of the conclusions, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll talk more about this. Uh, so Lana developed this field center that is able to analyze the query and decide whether or not this is an informational query. And if it is informational, then our guess is that the best match approach would work better for this query. Um, so just so you know, it was implemented around almost in August, so here. So the use of best match already started increasing at the time, but I think that if it is as dramatic and exponential as this is, is also because of the banner. It's hard to know uh, the importance of each factor. I think people like the new systems, the new system, but also that the banner is, is uh, emphasizing this increase as well. So um, this concludes my talk and um, I, I think there are still some questions to be answered, and particularly uh, I introduced relevance as, as a, approximated by user clicks, and uh, is this really a good definition of relevance? But on the other hand, you know, is, a, is an expert evaluation of documents for a given query a good relevance score as well? I'm not sure, because the people that we have on PubMed are from experts in a given field to lay people, uh, trying to investigate on someone's disease that they know. Uh, so it's really hard to know what relevance is. And maybe actually, um, at least that's what I think, I think that providing the users what they expect is 
the target instead of providing them the actual optimal relevance. Um, now it's a specific domain, so like I said, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of users, we have a lot of uh, logs, but most of it is unique. So we have to find ways to, to overcome this, this problem and, and generate um, relevant signals out of it anyway. It's done, yeah, on the more recent approaches, but I haven't um, released anything on this yet. So um, the evaluation that we performed is both quantitative by using analytics like click-through rate or usage and qualitative because we also had user studies. Um, the click-through rate improved by 19 to 20% relatively on the first page. Um, usage almost doubled, again, this is uh, with a grain of salt because we had the banner also uh, impact this conclusion. But overall, we also got feedback from people reaching out and uh, it's always, you know, it always feels good when a clinician says that you're helping healthcare and that you've improved the life of someone. Uh, so, so that's always good to have. And uh, we have recently developed PubMed Labs. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's an experimental platform where we can try more um, uh, newer features, for instance, based on machine learning that don't scale much yet, but still provide uh, us a sense of how good it would work in the live system if we could implement it. Um, so in this system, for instance, one of the experiments is um, best match is actually the default sort order, which is different from PubMed where the date sort is the default. Um, some people complained, but it seemed to be embraced by a majority of people. So it seems like this is what the users would expect after typing a query. And uh, for the sake of the paper that we recently wrote on this, I have also developed a GitHub repository where I show just the proof of concept of all this pipeline and approach. So there are remaining questions. And uh, the first one I have is um, whether BM25 is a good metric for the first layer. We rely everything on the top 500 results. And uh, BM25, as far as I know, is not recall oriented. So we might want to choose another uh, method here to make sure that we retrieve all the potentially doc relevant documents in the 500 before re-ranking them. Um, I also don't think that we can reach a better NDCG in the current setting. Uh, and this is because, like you said, we currently have only one model for 36,000 queries. And one model cannot fit all of the user intents, all of the uh, query variety that, it, uh, that the, this data set contains. Like I said, there might not be a single definition of relevance. Um, there, might, there will not be a single user intent uh, modeled by one model, realistically. And um, even for the same query, some users might expect different things. Uh, and here, for instance, how does a patient advocate compares to a clinician? They might type exactly the same query, but the, the papers they are looking for are completely different. So there's no free lunch. That's uh, well known in machine learning. Right now, we're calculating a single model for all of these queries, and I don't think this is optimal. Also, queries change over time. We don't account for this uh, right now. Um, so one way to to improve this, I think, is to have several models if we can classify queries, for instance, and then identify the, category, the query category or the user intent and then select the model um, that is appropriate for this need. We also experimented with deep learning. I'm personally wondering now whether it's worth it um, because first, the tree ensemble models are working very well uh, as soon as you provided the, the, the right data. Um, and it might just work well. And actually, when I went to CGIR this year, I realized that many industries are still relying on in live systems. They're still relying on, on tree ensembles or, or other ensembles of models because that's the, the most scalable ones. Whereas deep learning is usually more used of, offline and not in live uh, production systems. But it's worth uh, trying in the meantime. And finally, there are other signals that um, we could integrate, again, Every time, we need to, every time we want to integrate such signal into the relevance equation to build the gold standard, we increase the complexity of, the, the, of optimizing the parameters in this 
equation. So what is the weight, for instance, let's say that I want to have the time spent on the page as part of this, uh, the relevance scoring, what's its weight? How does it compare to abstract click on, or full text click? So on and so forth. So we want to integrate all of these, but it, it becomes exponentially difficult to, to do so. So the research I've presented here is, um, you know, from the previous system to the new system by using machine learning. And I have done all the research on machine learning, experimenting with algorithm, designing features, collecting logs, all of these things I've presented today, but actually put, in order to put it into production, we needed the help of many people. Uh, especially the first guys here uh, were in charge of implementing and maintaining this into production. Um, the recent developments of PubMed Labs are uh, handles, handled by Jane. Ross have, has left us recently, but also Asta, Martin. Uh, we also needed the help of Cathy for um, running experiments of, on PubMed because running A-B testing on a live government website is not as easy as you might think. And finally, uh, my PI Jeonglu for, for this project. Um, thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have any more. <laughs>